I asked my students in class today to define the word number for me. The first response I got was, was like nobody was there. But then the brain gears started working as they pondered my question. They started trying out some definitions. Unit of measurement. How we understand the universe. How we keep track of things. What we use to identify how many. And then a student said, the word number can mean so many things. It could be a time, code, amounts. How are we supposed to define it? Well, that's a good question. We take numbers for granted, so much so that we have a hard time defining them. Believe it or not, the human's concept of numbers and mathematics has developed slowly over thousands and thousands of years. Not only that, but these concepts developed differently in different parts of the world. It's actually quite difficult to track it all down accurately. Let's go back in time and explore a bit. I'll take you through a few of the highlights, but keep in mind that this is an oversimplification of the history of math and numbers. It's just to give you an idea. Even though what you'll see at times looks super simple, many civilizations were able to do quite complicated math with what we consider rather primitive notations and tools. Imagine some of our nomadic ancestors that were hunters, gatherers. They didn't have a concept for addition or subtraction or multiplication or division. At least, not the way we think of those concepts today. But they certainly would have known the difference between a huge herd of buffalo and just one isolated one. They would have had the main idea of more or less. To be honest, we don't have much evidence to tell us what they really knew or didn't know. Our first evidence of any sort of mathematical tools or knowledge were actually bones. It was kind of what they used as paper, a place to write things down. The oldest one is called the Lamambo bone, and it was found in Swaziland in the southern part of the African continent. It dates back 35,000 years. Our next piece of evidence is the Ashango bone, which was found in the Congo, just north of Swaziland. This one is 25,000 years old, which is still really old, but 10,000 years younger. Can you see a difference in the bones? The Ashango bone has marks, just like the Lamambo bone, but these marks look like they are in groups. Mathematicians and historians aren't really sure what these marks mean. They could be the beginning of deliberate counting, or they could be marking parts of the lunar calendar. It's even possible that it's the very early stages of addition and subtraction. Let's fast forward about 21,000 years to 4,000 BC. We're in Sumeria, and by now, Towns and villages have begun developing around the world. That means that people are beginning to trade a bit. Animals or crops or other goods. But how are they to keep track of it all? The need for a more sophisticated number system emerged because counting had become really important. These ancient Sumerians, which is now southern Iraq, used tokens of various shapes and sizes to represent goods. By trading, a person would increase or decrease the amount of goods, and therefore tokens, that he had. Aha! Increasing and decreasing. You know what that sounds like? This is definitely addition and subtraction. Let's move forward another thousand years or so and take a peek into neighboring Egypt, now around 3000 BC. Here, numbers have taken on another use. In addition to just keeping track of goods and trade, the Egyptians have begun using numbers as a way of measuring. I mean, you gotta plan those pyramids carefully. And in a stroke of genius, 
they've created symbols to represent different numbers. A one, it's just a line. A 10 looks like an upside down horseshoe. I think my favorite symbol is the one for 100,000. It's a frog. The number for 1 million was a person on his knees. But it's unclear to historians whether this is a god or a prisoner begging for forgiveness. My husband thinks that it's the first evidence of American football. It's the pharaoh signaling the touchdown. Either way, humans now have ways of writing out bigger numbers instead of just a ton of tally marks. In addition to these symbols, the Egyptians also developed a way of showing parts, or what we'd call fractions. They just draw part of an eye. But we'll talk more about fractions later because for right now, though they do have a way to express a fraction, doing calculations with these eye-looking symbols was quite impossible. The Egyptians weren't the only ones who tried using symbols, though. Let's visit Rome in 800 BC. What are these? Yeah, they're Roman numerals, and this is where you'd have seen them first. The Romans were, and are, a society known for its advancements and all kinds of technologies. They built the Colosseum, a lot of statues, the Pantheon, and aqueducts, and all kinds of cool things. In fact, we could spend days talking about Rome and its ingenuity, but actually, these Roman numerals, as great as they were at the time, were very bulky and still a bit tough for making calculations. I want to take you now to India, around 500 BC. Here I think you'll see something that looks familiar. Do you recognize anything here? It's the beginning of this. These are what we now call Arabic numerals. These simpler notations for numbers were key to a whole system that would make calculating easier. Let's take a minute to review where we've been. So far, we've seen a lot of progress. And although we've seen evidences of fractions and such, the main things that we used for efficient calculations were only the numbers starting at one and going up from there. Today, we call these numbers natural numbers. And this is where the history of numbers really starts speeding up. We're still hanging out in India, but now it's around 458 AD. We just jumped forward almost a thousand years. India was one of the places that first invented, are you ready for it? This is huge. The number zero. What? The number zero was invented? Well, kind of. It's more than a workable symbol for nothing was invented. Up until now, people would draw a picture of some sort to represent nothing. But doing calculations could be a bit tricky when you're using pictures or even just a blank space as a placeholder. Enter Brahmagupta. This amazing mathematician lived from 598 to 670 AD. Less than 200 years after zero was invented, Brahmagupta wrote out the first rules for dealing with zero. Rules such as when zero is added to a number or subtracted from a number, the number remains unchanged. Today, we call that the identity property of zero. Here's another one. A number multiplied by zero becomes zero. We call that the multiplication property of zero. I know this sounds really obvious, but remember, you've grown up with this. This was all new to them. So the number zero opened up a whole new ability to calculate. Now we're talking about what today we call the whole numbers. They're just like natural numbers, but we've added zero. Our friend Brahmagupta also gave us rules for dealing with negative numbers. Check these out and see if you can translate them. I'll give you a hint. 
A debt is a negative number. A fortune is a positive number. Let's try the first one. A debt minus zero is a debt. So a negative minus zero is still a negative. Again, I know this is obvious to you, but it was absolutely revolutionary then. Of course, just like zero, the concept of negatives had been around for quite some time in cultures all over the world. But now we had an easier way to represent them. So here in India, with the partnership of zero, the Arabic numerals, and that little dash sign to make a negative, we now have the ability to calculate more effectively with negative numbers. Our set of usable tools for calculations has just grown from natural numbers to whole numbers and now to what we call integers. Integers are all the whole numbers, but now both negative and positive. And Brahmagupta still isn't done. In some of his works, we see the earliest form of a fraction with one number on top of another. Now, for quite some time, there was no bar between them, which could get really confusing. Eventually, the Arabs added the bar between the top and bottom numbers. We need to thank them for that. It was just a simple change, but it sure makes life easier. This is all fantastic. Not because fractions were invented, remember the Egyptians had used fractions earlier, but now we can use them so much more effectively. So let's add fractions to our list of usable tools. And now we have the rational numbers, which are all of the integers plus anything that can be written in the form of a fraction. Now, let's pause a moment and look. You see, I put a decimal in there. It says 0.5, but 0.5 can also be written as 1 half, so it fits. We'll cover rational numbers more in a few weeks. This is just an overview. Our mathematical toolbox is almost complete, but we are still missing some crazy numbers. You might even call them irrational. We'll enjoy learning about those when we get to geometry. In the meantime, we need to get back to the original question. What is a number? After looking through the history, I would say that a number is a symbol that represents a quantity, amount, measurement, or position. Can you believe you made it through a whole lesson on the history of numbers? It wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs>